The inerrancy of scripture is an oddly divisive topic among devout Christians. Some see inerrancy as completely required for the Christian faith because how else can we be assured that the Bible is true? While other believers see it as forcing them to defend indefensible cultural and scientific positions and ideas from thousands of years ago. Verbal inspiration or total inerrancy is the belief that God gave the exact words of the Bible to the original writers, and it is therefore completely accurate and perfect in every detail. Not Mary Poppins practically perfect, really truly perfect. Inerrancy gives a great deal of certainty to one's belief, which is a very appealing concept. It's also what Islam teaches about the Quran. Sadly, I have seen inerrancy used a great deal as a way of bolstering a leader's beliefs into being inerrant and beyond question, creating an atmosphere where questions themselves are not welcome and where everyone must submit to a particular interpretation of the Bible. The issue of total inerrancy is also what lies behind some Christians' notable stance against the teaching of some scientific ideas in school, including astronomy, evolutionary theory, and geologic dating, to name just a few. Because such theories contradict a literal interpretation of the Bible, and if God supplied every single word of the Bible, then the Bible cannot be wrong. The problem is that despite the passion that many Christians put into the subject of inerrancy, when it comes time to define what is actually inerrant, many believers start to struggle. This is how the conversation usually goes. The Bible is the inerrant word of God. Okay, which Bible? This one? It's got Legos in it. Or, or what, what about this one? This one's in rhyme. Are these inerrant? Those aren't Bibles. Why not? They say they are, same as all of the rest. Look, I, I know that those examples were a little hyperbolic, but what about paraphrases like the Living Bible or the Message? They diverge rather significantly from other versions at times due to trying to maintain readability. So they're radically different. They can't all be without error because they don't match. All right, the direct translation of the Bible is an error. That's better, but anyone can translate the Bible. I've translated a number of books of the Bible myself, but no one, including me, is claiming that they're inerrant. Recognized published translations, the sorts of translations that are in the pews of churches, those are inerrant. But every version of the Bible ever made has significant errors in it. The King James Bible had over 400 variations fixed in the first two years of its printing. And in 1631, one version of the Bible was printed, which made the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt commit adultery. The Bible in the pew is not without error. No Bible has ever been printed without error. Those are copy errors, mistakes in printing. Those aren't errors in the text itself. That's true, but there are hundreds of English translations available today, and none of them fully agree. Is only one of them inerrant? And if there is one perfect version of the Bible, why is it in English? Why did God wait 1,300 years after Jesus to present the world with the perfect version? If you copy the Quran into English... It is no longer considered sacred writing because they've recognized that the act of translating changes it somewhat. And they're right. Verbal inspiration cannot survive translation because the act of translation changes something. Do we really want to claim that God is letting everyone else rot with inferior texts while we alone have the perfect version? That's because it isn't the English that's inerrant. The original language versions are the ones that are without error. Any translation can be wrong. Yes, now we're getting somewhere. The Bible was originally written in Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament, and we have almost 6,000 manuscripts for the New Testament alone. However, none of them of any size fully agree with each other. Those copy errors that we were talking about earlier existed even more frequently when the text was handwritten. In those 6,000 manuscripts, we have around 200,000 textual variants between them. Nearly all of those variants are minor, don't get me wrong, but any change is enough to break verbal inspiration and total inerrancy. We have no perfect version. 
In fact, the versions that we do have are copies of copies. The Old Testament that we read, for instance, is based heavily upon the Leningrad Codex, which is a particular Old Testament that was written 2,000 years after King David and 1,000 years after Jesus walked the earth. That is a lot of copying going on. And while the copies we have are good and reliable, they are not inerrant. Fine. But the original writings were inerrant. We just have corrupted versions. Those handwritten originals were called autographs. And not only don't we have them, we wouldn't be able to recognize them if we did. And even if we had them, Paul repeatedly says that some of what he says is his own opinion and not from God. Not everything in the Bible is from God. The Bible says so. Even the original autographs will show the handprints of people as well as God. On top of this, Paul did not personally write down most of his letters. He used a scribe or an amanuensis to write it down for him. That means that even the originals of Paul's letters would have been subject to the same scribal errors as all of the other copies ever made. Because even the originals of Paul's letters were already scribal copies. Finally, remember, Jesus himself didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic and possibly Hebrew. That means even the original Gospels do not have the exact words of Jesus. They have a translation. And in every translation, something is gained and something is lost. Even the best translation is not perfect, and the Greek Gospels are already a translation of Jesus' words, meaning they were already subtly changed before they ever hit parchment. I hate you. I get that a lot. Surely we can agree that Jesus' original spoken words were without error? Sure, but we don't have them. We can't even accurately back-translate Jesus' words because we aren't completely sure at any given moment what language he was speaking originally. The bottom line is that nothing we have is perfect. Nothing is without the slightest bit of error. And our theology should be based on what we can read and interact with right now. And the truth is, there is no inerrant version of the Bible today in English or any other language. I truly, truly wish there were, but there isn't. And defending an inerrant scripture without actually having it means that we're backed into corners that we can't get out of and yet don't have the confidence that we would have gotten from having that inerrancy. All of the problems and none of the assurance. But the Bible says all scripture is God breathed. Absolutely, but since when does that mean inerrant? We need to look at the second half of that verse. All scripture is God breathed and useful. That's the cutoff line. Not inerrant, useful. When did we get so stuck on inerrancy that we don't accept any other method of inspiration? None of the early church councils or early Christian creeds say anything about biblical inerrancy. So why is it such a big deal to us? It's important because without inerrancy, the Bible loses its inspiration, which means it loses its authority and we lose our guidance. How? Inerrancy is an on-off switch. I get that, but authority isn't like that. Inspiration isn't like that. My parents had more authority over me growing up than anyone else in my entire life. That doesn't mean that they were inerrant. And in no way did that negate the good they did in my life or somehow minimize their authority over me. So why does the Bible have to be inerrant in order to have authority over us? Nothing else in our lives requires that. Every other authority in our lives can have error and we're fine with it. It doesn't take away its authority, so why do we assume that it does with the Bible? Preachers claim to be inspired every Sunday morning, and Christians around the world have said that God gave them a word to say, and we accept that without saying that nothing that comes out of their mouths can be wrong. We accept that while the best sermon we've ever heard contained God's truth for us, that truth was also funneled through the mouth and mind of a pastor, and so can contain inaccuracies and errors. How does it degrade the Bible to say the same 
same thing happened with the biblical writers. That the same Holy Spirit, the same inspiration and guidance that we seek today happened to them. I find it liberating and empowering to think that the same Holy Spirit, the same sort of inspiration that the writers of the Bible had, I can have too. That instead of just being a passive recipient of ancient truth, I can participate in the process of refinement and guidance and inspiration that God uses to make sure that the truths of Scripture are passed down to the next generation. This allows us to say that not only did God inspire the original text, but continued to inspire in the preservation of that text and is still working to guide us in the use and the transmission of that text today. God didn't just speak perfectly to the original writers and then ignore the entire process from then on. If we look at God's inspiration as one of continual guidance through history and not just initial inspiration, then we can say that the big picture concepts of Scripture, the primary focuses of Scripture, salvation and relationship with God, that God has kept intact and preserved inerrantly. The Bible is the best preserved text of the ancient world. Its text and its meaning is actually quite secure. Just not perfectly secure. The Bible can handle authority and inspiration quite easily. It just can't handle the doctrine of verbal inspiration and total inerrancy that people force upon it. Something that neither the Bible itself nor early Christianity claimed for it. Inerrancy makes us defend as divine truth a host of grammatical errors, outdated worldviews, cultural oddities, and the personal baggage of the individual writers. It forces us to major on the minor issues because every single thing has to be defended in order for the Bible to remain inerrant. And in the end, it gives us nothing because no version that we can pick up and read today in any language is wholly inerrant. It's okay to say that the Bible is flawed. It's okay to say that there are mistakes and even errors in it. That in no way takes away from saying that it is God-breathed and it is incredibly useful and even essential for today. It doesn't mean that it isn't inspired or authoritative or relevant. It just means that we aren't going to defend the minutia that can't be defended. It means that we think God used people to write the text. And some of those people came through as well. And that's a good thing because it means that God can also work through us, despite us even. And that's a beautiful thing. I don't think the Bible is totally, completely inerrant in all things. I do believe that God's continued inspiration means that the Bible inerrantly does what it was meant to do. Show us how people encountered God in the past and how we can do the same thing today. And that's more than enough for me. As always, thank you for watching. Hope I didn't screw you up too much. Have a great day. See you next video.